Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our session today, talking about the dignity of work and the rights of workers. Let us begin in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, thank you for creating me and giving me the abilities I need to work. Help me remember that I'm really working for you. When I need to stand up for you and the truth, when I need to help someone in need, give me the courage to do so. Lift up my coworkers who need prayer and build them up into your kingdom. Let me listen intently to your voice and let all that I do glorify you. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Alrighty, so today we have our next major theme of Catholic social teaching, the dignity of work and the rights of workers. This will complete a three-part set where we focused on our place in society. We started by looking at human dignity, then the role of the family in society, and now we focus on how we get involved in the various affairs of daily life outside of the home in many cases. We will begin today by talking about some of the biblical teachings on work and the dignity of work because it's done by persons. The second part of our talk will look at our place within economic life as a whole. And then we'll conclude by looking at nine basic rights of workers outlined by the Catholic Church. My remarks today are taken from the Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church from 2005 and Pope John Paul II's encyclical Laborum Exercens from 1981. So, without further ado, let's begin. Oh dear, don't fall. So, biblical aspects of work. We start with Genesis 1. We know that God has created the world and has entrusted it to us human beings to care for according to good stewardship. Uh, God gives Adam and Eve responsibility for caring for the garden and naming the animals and in many ways being responsible for the well-being of this world he created. So that is a special form of dominion which God has given to human beings. A dominion which is not to recklessly use the resources of this world, but one which properly takes care of things and ensures that they work towards what God intended. Now, in the beginning, everything was great. Adam and Eve didn't really have to work. They just walked up to whatever tree they wanted to eat from other than the forbidden one, and then they are happy. Um, but because they sinned, they no longer can just take whatever they want from these trees. They have to work for it. So after sin, in Genesis 3.19, God tells Adam part of the consequences for his original sin are that it is only by the sweat of his brow that he will reap the rewards of labor and be able to provide for himself and his family. So throughout the scriptures, we see how people really struggle and work hard to bring about their goals and to care for themselves and their families. Looking to Jesus, we see a great example of a worker. Presumably, under his father, he was an apprentice as a carpenter, so he did much to uh, use his physical talents for the benefit of others. But in a more profound way, we look to Jesus to see his work of spreading the good news, the gospel, his work of sharing God's love were the most marginalized in society. He was a man who taught what he received from God and also looked to people in need so he could perform works of mercy for them, to be kind, uplifting, to correct them if they needed adjustment in their lives, but to really commit his whole life to this project. We can look to Jesus as someone we can imitate as a faithful worker in the vineyard of the Lord. We imitate Jesus by doing God's work in the world, 
no matter what we do, whether it be in service to the church, a business, or consumers, we are in some way sharing the goodness of what God has intended for our society. We are participating in that. So, one other thing to mention, St. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4.12 says that we should work so as not to depend on anyone. In that sense, he's talking about how you know we shouldn't just mooch off of other people. We should do our part to build a responsible life for ourselves, and perhaps with any surplus we have, we can give to others. Now, there will be times in your life, of course, that you will depend on people. It's inevitable, based on being human. Um, but we need to be responsible and care for others so that we can thrive together. So, that's a little introduction to some points about work mentioned in the Bible. There's much more we could get into, but we'll move on. The next section here looks at the dignity of work. Why is work special? Why is work something more than just going to work, putting in your hours, and going home as soon as you can? Work has two dimensions to it. There's an objective dimension, and there's a subjective one. Let's first talk about the objective aspects of work. I apologize, I'm gonna to have to get into a little bit of economics here, um, but we'll try to make it simple enough. So in work, what do you do? You make things or you perform services. So the objective dimension of work has to do with the outcome of what you're doing. Now, when you produce something, whether it's um, constructing a microwave to sell or whether it's uh, being a caseworker for someone and serving them, those involve, first and foremost, your human labor. You go to work, you do your duty, and you collect your pay. But there's also the things that you use in work. So there are uh, certain things that you might use that are natural goods, things in the world. Uh, maybe if you want to build a table, you go out, cut down a tree, and then take that wood through your labor, you make it into a nice table. Um, you might use some machines to make that table. So you might use a hammer. Um, and that's an example of capital. Capital is something where you, you use something to help transform natural goods into products. Very simply, when we're at work, we can, as laborers, use things of the world God has given us and special technologies that we've invented uh, with God's help to make products. And when we're talking about uh, services we provide, we have to be trained, right? We can't just uh, never study anything and then just assume we're gonna be able to be a good counselor. We can't just assume that um, without putting in the effort to train ourselves, develop our skills, that we'll be able to um, use all of our potential. So there are different types of capital. Um, physical capital is like machines, like you might use a machine to build something. Um, human capital is a term sometimes used to talk about our skills that we have been educated in, that we've been formed by society to be better laborers so that we can be more productive. So those things have to do with the factors of production. Uh, natural goods, labor, and capital. That's the objective dimension of work. But if that's all there was to work, we wouldn't be talking about the dignity of work. So the subjective dimension of work is what makes it truly dignified. The subjective dimension of work has to do with our personal involvement with work. As mentioned a couple weeks ago, we have immeasurable human dignity because we are made in God's image and likeness with the freedom to know and love God and other people in our world and to participate in God's plan. We have that special role as persons in the workplace. We have special dignity. So there is a priority of the person, the laborer, over the machines they use to make things. You'd probably have 
no chance of making amazing things without machines. Um, but although the machines are important, you, the worker, are more important. Work is an expression of your freedom, your potential, your power, your agency, which God has given you. Since it's based on your free choice to do good in the world, it's never to be used as slave labor. Work is instead a free expression of the person. So humans are always to be valued. And you should not value someone based on how productive they can be. God has blessed some people with more talents in certain areas than others. But that does not make one person more dignified than another. So, in other words, no matter what skills you have, no matter how much human capital you have, you are to be valued as someone in the image and likeness of God. So that relates to the subjective dimension of work. All right. So we're going to be talking today about some of the concrete rights that workers have because of their human dignity. But to get a broader picture of things, we're going to talk about our role as workers in the broader economy. Because work is not just something I as an individual do to get my paycheck. It is contributing in something greater than myself, contributing to society's work. And so we're going to detail that a little bit here. So in Catholic social teaching, we believe that it's important for everyone to have access to wealth and property. Because if we don't, then those who don't will not thrive as God intended. We need certain goods on a very basic level to live a humane life. So Catholic social teaching points out two special things here. One is that you have the freedom to acquire private property through work. If you go outside, you find a tree, you cut it down, you turn it into firewood, that firewood is yours because you've used your labor to transform that into something usable, something that helps you to heat your home. Um, so in that sense, since work is something freely done, it is a deeply personal act. It shouldn't be, that freedom shouldn't be restricted in any profound way. But there's another side to this equation. If you could just acquire as much private property as you want, you could leave nothing for anyone else. And that would be a problem. So the church also teaches the following thing, which is the universal destination of goods. Basically, that means that everybody in society should have access to the things God has given to us, the natural goods in the world, but also access to the things that God has enabled us as a society through our human talents to make available to the world. So the universal destination of goods means that natural goods, capital, and products made through work must not be hoarded. You can also say that services shouldn't be provided only for an elite class of people, but should be available to all. So summarizing, we have the freedom to acquire property through work, but we also can't hoard property so that others don't have uh, as much and as good access to it. All right, next point is that in society, there are various types of goods. There is our own particular good that's private to me. It's good for me to build or to buy a home for my family. It's important to me to have a car to get to work, although maybe I might commute through public transportation. Um, it's important to me personally that I have food on my table and so on. But there's also the common good. 
the good in which all society participates. The common good is the good in which everyone in society participates and by which they flourish together as a united people. So it's something that we're united in. In society, we want to contribute together to the work of the general welfare, ensuring that there is safety and security in our society, making sure that we are acting for good purposes in society, that we come together as a united people for that good. So how does common good relate to our economy? There are different ideas about Catholic social teaching concerning justice. In our world, there are different types of justice that we use to help people. There is first and foremost, in this first aspect of social justice, you have commutative justice. Fancy word for individuals agreeing to buy and sell things from each other. Or an employer making a contract offer to an employee to agree to terms to work. Um, basically exchanging goods, products, money, or services, or labor between individuals or different uh, individual groups, that's commutative justice. So in society, we need to ensure that people are able to freely and fairly exchange with each other. The next part of social justice is distributive justice. This concerns what society owes its members for the sake of their particular good. So. Since everybody deserves access to the goods of this world, if there are a marginalized group of people who can't access that, society needs to ensure that they do. So they may distribute certain goods to them. The, final and, the third and final aspect of social justice is legal justice, or general justice, as it's otherwise known. This is what people in society owe society for the sake of the common good. So we might pay taxes so that the government can provide essential services to people. We might follow laws so that peace can be maintained. Um, we may certainly um, just serve our community in a way that is beneficial to its well-being. So basically, you have people on the ground making exchanges with each other. You have society offering things to individuals in need and you have everybody getting involved in the common good. That's basically social justice in three parts. So we have an important role to play in that as workers. But we also delegate some responsibilities to our governments uh, to maintain social order. And it's important to consider that um, because of the fact that not everybody has equal access to goods or equal opportunity to be a productive worker. Now, let's talk about economics 101, which is supply and demand. Very basically, there is a growing demand for products and services to satisfy our, you, our wants and needs. But the supply of products that we want to consume and the number of highly skilled workers able to provide services are limited or scarce they are insufficient to meet our current needs, our demands. That means we can't just take for granted that everybody can just get what they want. We need to take what God has given us and develop it into more so that others can have more of their needs and perhaps also their wants satisfied. So to satisfy society's demand, Additional wealth in the form of products and services must be created through human labor. And that's where we all come in. We enter into the work of producing wealth. Wealth being different um, products or services that we have access to that make our life more dignified or more, more um, happy, more fulfilled, and so on. Now, how do, we, how, how do we create wealth? Laborers create wealth by using physical capital, like machines, to develop 
natural goods into usable products. So for example, I use an ax as capital to cut down the tree to make firewood. You're taking the wood, the natural product, and the physical capital, the ax, to create, through your labor, the product of firewood. And that can be something contributing to wealth. You have something you can heat your home with. Um, so that's one way you can create wealth. Another way is by learning skills um, about how to relate to people, how to do certain things, um, whether or not you're using machines. Uh, you can educate yourself to be better informed about how to accomplish a service for someone. That can create wealth by serving the person in need, and then their lives are better off. So laborers have a special role in creating wealth for society so that all can be uh, happier and more fulfilled. All right, so if we need to be informed about how to use machines and develop our skills How's that going to happen? This must be developed through educational and cultural formation. Two weeks ago, we briefly mentioned that there are different rights that people have by virtue of being human. We live in a society, so society can't just ignore us and seal us up in a cave and never help us to engage in society. First and foremost, our parents and then our larger community have a responsibility to ensure that we are educated enough and aware of our culture enough to take from our culture what makes us fulfilled. So humans have a right to be educated, to learn about how to be more productive workers so that they too can share in the goals of the economy. So in order for this to be done fairly, we have to consider, once again, the universal destination of goods. The fact that everything should be accessible to everyone. This implies two things. First, that everyone should have equal access to existing natural goods and products, and that everyone should have access to the means of formation through education and so on, necessary to build their human capital, in other words, to learn skills, Understand how to create or at least use physical and financial capital. So you might never own a piece of complex machinery, but if you go to your workplace and use it, um, that's going to be making you more productive. And um, you should be able to create wealth with your various forms of capital, your skills, your machines, and the money you have invested to produce things. All right, so we all have a right to develop our talents and to have access to goods and services. How does society make sure this happens? So there are different economic systems that have been tried in various societies over the years. Um, and ideally, an economic system um, tries to balance two things. One a person's right to own and prof profit from their capital, the things they have in their possession that help them to produce things. Um, and um, there's the second concern that society has a right to access and use capital to create wealth for all its members. So for example, um, Right. The internet was created recently, right? Not too long ago. And if this was something that were kept private to like 10 people for the next thousand years, that would really prevent society from benefiting from it in many ways. So being able to have access to internet is something that increases the wealth of society as a whole and makes people's lives better off, generally speaking. Although there are some negatives to all technologies. So, balancing people's right to what they produce with society's right to access it in some way so that they can participate in the, glo in the global effort of uh, flourishing. 
Now, problems can happen when one of these rights is focused on, but not so much the other. If all you focus on is people's right to own things and profit from them, then what you have is a laissez-faire capitalism, where there are no um, measures taken by government to ensure that people have fair access to things. It might just be that those capitalists who own things, own the machines, have all the bargaining power to ask laborers to work for them for pennies. Um, on the other hand, there's the other extreme. You could consider a communist regime where everything is owned by the government and just distributed to people according to its plan. Um, in that case, individuals' right to own property is not recognized at all. So you have two extremes that Catholic social teaching has always warned about. Laissez-faire capitalism on the one extreme without any intervention on the part of society for the sake of the worker. And on the other hand, a communist regime where people's rights and freedoms are not respected. So the church doesn't have a specific answer as to what precisely a good economic system would be, but it generally says that something in the middle, more of a mixed economic system uh, that blends some elements of capitalism and uh, not necessarily socialism, but possibly socialism, or some elements of socialism, such as social insurance, like uh, social security, or certain welfare to especially impoverished groups, that at the very least could be part of a solution to have a society where the worker is best able to share his or her talents with the world. So, that's the ideal. But our world is very imperfect. There are many injustices in our society. So what do we do? God has given us the freedom to uh, remedy imperfections through our acts of charity and justice. If society doesn't allow people to serve or be served, then we can step in and donate to an important cause. Don't uh, to volunteer to serve people who are underserved. We can do things through volunteer work, which is certainly work, unpaid work, but still immensely dignified, which helps our society to thrive better and better. All right. The rest of this is going to be very concrete stuff. We have the right to work. That means not only that, we have a right to be hired for any sort of job, but it means that we have the right to participate in economic life as a whole. We need to be formed as persons and as skilled workers so that we have a place in our society's economic life. Now, here are, according to the Catholic Church, nine basic rights of workers. These are not necessarily all the rights you have, but these are some basic categories. So this is modern Catholic social teaching. So some of these things are very modern concepts. The first is a right to a just wage, also called a living wage. This is the basic wage needed to ensure that earners' basic needs like food, shelter, education are met and that they and their families can live with dignity. At the Second Vatican Council, the church in its document Gaudium et Spes says the following. Wages should, quote, guarantee man the opportunity to provide a dignified livelihood for himself and his family on a material, social, cultural, and spiritual level, taking into account the role and the productivity of each, the state of the business, and the common good. So we need to ensure in society that people are being paid fairly for the work that they do, because they have dignity as persons, they have families, Family is the building block of society, so wages should uh, empower families to live well. The second right is the right to rest. On a day like today, on a Sunday, it's important to remember we're not meant only for work, but also, more importantly, for the love and worship of God. This is why God inspired the Jewish people, and Christianity to take a day 
apart from works, to focus on their relationship with God. Because if we get so involved with our work that we forget God, we sort of lose the point of why work has dignity. As persons, we need to keep in touch with our relationship with God, even while we're doing our work. Sometimes that's hard to do. Uh, but to be aware, time and time again, that we're doing this for a purpose, a purpose that God gives to us. That is important. The Compendium of the Social Doctrine of the Church says the following. One must not succumb to the temptation of making an idol of work. In other words, to be a workaholic. For the ultimate and definitive meaning of life is not to be found in work. Work is essential, but it is God and not work who is the origin of life and the final goal of man. So, if we make sure not to idolize our work, we can take time for needed leisure, for prayer, for building human relationships, because rest allows us to build those relationships with God and one another. So, the Sabbath rest of Judaism and Christianity is rooted in God's rest on the seventh day. Back in Genesis 1, after six days of work making creation, on the seventh day, God rests and sets up a pattern for all of us as well. Here's the next right. We're up to number three here. We have a right to a safe workplace. Companies should make sure that their employees are safe and any violations against health and safety should be regulated or punished by society. Um, because employers have a responsibility to care for their workers, not to just throw them into danger, but to give them what they need to succeed and to put in their work, contribute to the economic effort, and maintain their own dignity. We also have a right that uh, no, that one's personality should be safeguarded, which means that you should never be asked to do something that violates your conscience on the job. If your employer tells you to do something that you think is immoral, you always have the right to refuse. Because our moral conscience, which we have a responsibility to form, should guide us in what is right and wrong. We've received this help from God to have a good conscience so we know right from wrong. And if someone tells us to do something wrong, or if someone sort of represses your personality, makes you feel like just um, someone who puts in your time and doesn't really care for you as a person, that's a problem. If work takes all the personality out of it, it undermines the dignity of work. All right, so there's also the right to appropriate subsidies to aid unemployed workers. So this is one form of social insurance where a government will ensure that those who do not have a job unwillingly can have means to find a job and to rediscover their role in economic life. Um, so unemployment benefits are things that people have a right to because if society just says, you got fired from your job, too bad, you're on your own. That doesn't give proper dignity to the person who has God-given talents and needs to be supported while he or she finds a new place to work. People also have a right to uh, retirement plans uh, and insurance. So this also can be certainly given by employers. Oftentimes our health insurance is provided through employers. Sometimes it's just purchased on the market. Sometimes it's provided by government itself. Um, but whatever the source of such assistance in saving for retirement and uh, having insurance, um, this needs to be provided because when people are most vulnerable, that is not the time to look the other way and ignore people. That is when we need to step in and ensure that they can still feel included in our human family and have what they need to flourish. So employers in cooperation with governments have the obligation to help provide insurance for the medical care of employees and healthcare also, keep in mind, is a basic human right because it flows from the sanctity of human life 
and is essential to human dignity. The seventh right is the right to social security connected with maternity. That's the church's terminology for maternity leave or more broadly parental leave necessary to help the family when they have a newborn child especially. It can be very difficult to work and care for the child. So society has an interest in families, right? Last week we talked about how society has an interest in promoting family life. So if governments through various employers make available policies of parental leave that benefits families, that's great. Um, and then final, uh, two more here. The next is the right to assemble and form associations. So laborers have the right to gather with each other, decide on whether they're being treated fairly or unfairly by their employers. And if they decide to, enter into a labor union or any other sort of organization to work for their rights to ensure that they, their uh, services, their human dignity is being respected in the workplace. Um, and uh, labor unions can focus on securing things such as fair wages, decent working conditions, and adequate rest, uh, a, a workplace free of harassment, and things like that. And finally, when it comes down to it, people do have the right to strike. It is appropriate in certain situations for people to conduct a strike when it is absolutely necessary to secure better pay and working conditions. But when a strike is conducted, those participating should be careful not to use violence or shut down essential services in a community. So, on the whole, Today, we've looked at how our work has dignity. It is a God-given talent that God has enabled us to do, supporting us with the things he's given us in the world, allowing us the ingenuity to make products to make our work more productive. God has given work a special dignity to us in God's image and likeness. We share in economic life. We acquire private property for ourselves and our families, but we also work to ensure everybody in society has what they need to survive and to live a decent human life. We've talked about how we have a right to be educated, to be formed, so that we can be a productive member of society and not to be dependent on the few educated elite who tell us what to do. We've talked about seeking a balance between the right to property and the right of access of all two things. And we talked about nine basic rights of workers. So that is my lesson for today. And now we have time for any questions that you have about the dignity of work, economic life, or the rights of workers. Yeah. I think most people, or not most, <laughs> yeah. general, yeah. stupid, best comment. Um, a lot of people today, they're just happy to have a handout. I mean, look at, you go to a restaurant, there's not enough workers. Restaurants aren't open seven days a week anymore because they can't get the workers. Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. You go to a store, most stores, Try to find somebody to help you. People are not working. There are jobs. Stewart's always has signs out there. Mm. Jobs available. Come and we're hiring. But where do you get the people? Mm. And there's people out there without the jobs. Yeah. But you know, that's the problem we run into. That certainly is a problem. Um, Underutilization of uh, potential laborers. Um, we don't come out of the womb ready to work, right? We have to be trained, habituated, uh, developing good habits so that we see work not just as something I have to do, but you actually find joy in it because you're contributing to something. Now, 
there are certainly people who have miserable jobs, whether it be because they're uh, treated unfairly or whether they have so much going on in their life, they can't even take time to find joy in their work. Um, and it can make work less human. Uh, uh, so we always have compassion for people in situations like that who have throughout their life always experienced work as something dreadful and never uh, fulfilling. Um, but if we as society can really reach out to those and help form them to develop these good habits, um, then we can all find a place, hopefully, uh, in our economy to, uh, to work well. Um, yeah, and to be able to train people to have the skills that they would need to have an enjoyable job, right? Because if we don't train people, they're going to have to do some miserable job that anybody can do, but nobody wants to do. Yeah. Tom. Yeah, as I, as I, you know, on that point, as I talk to people, because that's a, a common problem that people have um, said, is like, look, there's all these jobs out there, and no one's taking the jobs, and instead they're getting, you know, the government help. Um, when I hear from people who have taken that option, this is what I hear. What I hear is that um, I am making more money um, being paid for by the government on a short-term basis than I am paid by by any boss. Mm -hmm. And so I think the Catholic issue, this is one of the things that I, I you know, I, 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 it's obviously up for discussion and we should discuss it as a church, is, is our minimum wage or our living wages what they ought to be? You know, so, you know, the idea of a living wage, which going back to what Michael said, is like, okay, I can flourish with this amount of money. My family will have what they need. But it was interesting, the point that he read from the church document, from God Amos says, said not just economic or, you know, housing or whatever, but also cultural flourishing, right? It's not, you're not just a matter of what you eat and drink, whatever, but you should be able to have a little bit to enjoy life, right? Like, even if it's like you go to the movies or something. Um, I think there's, a, you know, a lot of people out there who, who are just wondering, is that the best for me, you know? And I think, you know, I, I feel the same way. I just read a story, uh, it was, a, I forget where it was, but it was a hospital, and basically um, a bunch of hospital workers, and you may have run into the story, they were about to take a new position at another hospital because it was a better schedule, better life for their families, better pay, and a judge put an injunction against them that was filed on the part of the hospital they were working at saying, you can't take that job. And it was just like, well, wait a minute, is this person free to flourish in their society? And I think there's, I think both have to be balanced, you know? Yeah, so to your point, there are sort of two ways of coming at this problem. One is to ensure that wages are just and in, they incentivize people to actually work, right? If it's, if you're working for peanuts, why are you going to work if you have something else? But the other side of it is to ensure that any welfare programs or any social insurance have uh, built into it the idea that uh, it's dependent upon, in some way, you being able to find work, uh, making the effort to find work, right? So uh, benefits could be temporary or built or structured in such a way that as people find jobs, they are actually incentivized. They might get further benefits for having found a job, and then those are phased out. Um, so not just blank, in a blanket policy, just dumping money on people, but working with them in their situation, getting real with them, having caseworkers, getting involved with their situation, helping them to find their potential and to contribute to society. And that way, we can at the same time respect their dignity and provide for their basic needs while they discover themselves and their place in the world, and also, you know, give them that responsibility to take on for themselves as part of their human dignity, because we are made to be responsible for one another. It's not just that we have rights, that it's all about me. I need to have my rights protected. I also have a responsibility to society, according to legal justice or general justice. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, what comes to my mind when we're talking about this, it isn't maybe directly, but I think when we get into the atmosphere of our own workplaces, people get so consumed with bettering themselves and bettering their own their own condition or their own 
uh, rising in the company or whatever it is. That we don't pay enough attention to buoying up the other. That love that St. Paul talked about, you know, the, you know, sacrificing himself for the good of the other. And I think um, I started to think about it with with what Elaine said. And I think that we don't we don't put ourselves out to say to people who are around us in the workplace, you make my job better because you're here. My my work is better. And I hope my work makes your work better, you know, <laughs> to, um, to make people feel valued no matter what their work is, mm -hmm. whether it's the person who empties your uh, trash receptacle or whether it's the person who cleans the restrooms or whether it's the person who wipes down the handles of the doors, um, to make them say, thank you for what you do. You, your being here makes my work better and easier. Mm -hmm. And I think that gives people incentive to take a little bit of of pride and a little bit of uh, ownership of whatever they do. And and I think some of that goes a long way. Absolutely. Yeah. I think just um, the, the concept of lack of God and spirituality in the world is why the struggles that there are. I mean, the millionaires and multi-millionaires and multi-billionaires that are out there, the world would be such a better place. <coughs> like just, just, you know, for example, you know, Amazon, you know, what they're paying their employees could be a whole lot more than it is because at this point, someone's worth $400 billion. And yet, you know, a worker's making $15 an hour. Hmm. Which, I mean, this day and age, take care of a home, a wife and kids, and have a car, that's just not going to get it done. Hmm. <clears throat> so, you know, without a, a greater um, influx of faith in the world and people finding a religion maybe to, to follow, the, the issue is always going to be there because... The billionaire wants to be a two billionaire, wants to be a three billionaire, and yet the person that's you know working in stores making fifteen dollars an hour, mm. you know that that's you know what they're making. Yeah. So th it's just the wealthiest of the world are not being Christian, I guess, to share you know sharing their profits, mm. and not to say that many of them haven't worked very hard for what they've achieved, but still, what about that guy that's that woman, that guy that's trying to take care of the family. Sure. Yeah, so that's not to say that wealth in itself is wrong. It's that the greed that takes advantage of the person in order to get wealth. Um, because wealth is something that people should only acquire if they've also created wealth for others to enjoy in society. Um, if you're promoting, like, on, in one sense, we want to make sure that um, monopolies don't form to such an extent that they have all the control of the capital in their industry and prevent other small businesses in the same area from popping up and paying their workers at a more uh, humane rate. Um, so there shouldn't be any form of what we would call crony capitalism where um, companies basically uh, lobby politicians to give them benefits and that's a form of what's called rent seeking that we uh, in, uh, wealthy individuals wealthy companies try to get to raise their their funds without actually doing any work because uh, it's not like um, you're creating wealth when you get the government to subsidize what you're doing but the goal of a company is to provide a service or a product to the community. And if they're not focused on that, they're focused just on the money, that can be problematic. And it should be subject to governmental regulation if they're doing something that undermines the value of, of people. Definitely. Yeah. Yes. For the sake that this is would want to claim the business expense of what they pay their workers. So if they pay their workers more, when it comes time for the government to look at what their income is, they want less income, so they won't be taxed as much. Mm. So you know, there's a benefit mm -hmm. to the to the company to paying 
good wages to workers so the worker can actually live on the wage that he makes mm -hmm. you know, from that one job. Yeah, as the profit a company makes increases, you would expect and would want society to proportionately raise the amount paid to its workers because it's not just... Since this company owns the machines, it deserves all the profits, right? Work is an essential part of production, and it's, it's human, too, so it has great dignity. So the compensation given to workers should be proportionate to the, the state of the business, the profits it's making. Right, and if it isn't, then a way around that is for the government to tax that company, so then there will be revenue for the country, for the nation to use, to support social programs that are necessary. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, other companies in the same field could pop up making those same profits and then they would have a benefit, they, since there would be more, uh, you know, more work desired, their work becomes more important and then they get paid more economically. But sometimes it doesn't work out that way because people gain the system. So it's important to uh, ensure society is uh, uh, running as it should. Yeah. Well, there is a problem, too, that um, I know situations where employees are not able to work extra hours. They want to, but they refuse extra hours because their, their food stamps will be cut. Their housing allowance will be cut mm -hmm. if they go over a certain amount. Yeah. That is not encouraging the work ethic. Mm -hmm. It's taking away from it. People want to work more. They'll, they're happy to work more, but they can't. Yeah. There, there are always flaws in the way that welfare co -op, uh, is integrated into getting work that you need sufficient for your, your livelihood. Um, so we can try to restructure welfare programs so that they don't, dis don't, don't disincentivize uh, workers from working more than they need to, or prevent employers from providing opportunity to be responsible to their employees. Yeah. And then you were going to say something further, perhaps? I, I'm not sure. Or uh, you were, right? Or someone was, I thought. Anyways, any other comments? I, I think one of the, I think the key takeaways is, you know, we don't normally thinking, think about um, promoting the dignity of the worker as a Catholic problem. But it is a Catholic problem. This is something that's rooted in doctrine. So to you know to be in a workplace, and I, I've you know I've worked a lot of crummy jobs, uh, you know, and I've you know I, I I've, I've been paid not enough, and I you know, and you kind of, as a worker you often feel helpless in those situations. Um, but it's kind of cool to think that there is um, there's a way you can assert your uh, your dignity. You know that you can, uh, you, you have value and worth, and uh, and trying to reform these structures is is something that's of concern to the Catholics. Hmm. And one thing you said uh, that made me think of something. Um, basically, if I mean the the well-being of a society is dependent upon how good a people we have, right? If all we are really focused on is things that aren't that important, like entertainment and luxury and exploiting people. That's where the money will be. That's where the money will be earned. And there will be less money given to the more virtuous and important things that we might do. Workers who do things that are really, truly beneficial to society. Um, like, I don't know if, uh, you know, Advertising Doritos to everybody is really going to help society as a whole. Um, but a lot of money goes that way, right? Um, perhaps if as a people, we focus on God's help to focus on more virtuous things and things that are healthier for us, um, that means that those who really do the good work of promoting human flourishing can be compensated fairly because the demand in society will be for what they're providing and not for things that lead us astray into uh, selfish worldly desires or things that are excessive or things like that. Yeah, so a society, no matter how well-built an economic system is, if you don't have a people that's willing to do what's good, 
then you're still going to have problems. So it's both the way that society is structured and the people living in it. They both have to be guided by these principles that God is giving to us and the help he's giving us to live it out. Definitely. Yep. We have time for one more question if anyone would like to. Yes. I just wanted to say that I don't think it's always a case of not wanting to work. In a lot of cases, it isn't a good idea. If you have a child and your job that you could get pays thirteen dollars and twenty cents, which is minimum wage in New York State, and you have to end up paying child care of two hundred dollars mm -hmm. for sub child care, so you're giving your child away to bring home a hundred dollars after tax or a hundred and fifty. Mm -hmm. I can see where it's not. I wouldn't want to do that yeah, with my family. Yeah, that that's why some governments would want to make the investment of providing child tax credits, for example, to offset the cost of putting a child in uh, right, a right daycare. Right now, we but, don't have that. So right now, I think it's unfair. And, and I agree, there's a lot of people taking advantage of the system. I agree with that. But there's a lot of good-hearted people that just can't work for what minimum wage is in New York yeah. State if yeah. you have children. Mm -hmm. You just can't do it. Yeah. Definitely. We need to promote families and keep that in mind. It's not just individual people out there in the workplace. It's fam people yeah, representing their families. They're going to suffer because they're going to go to some crazy daycare because yeah. that's all the, the poor mother can afford. Right. Definitely. We talked about having a safe work environment in the workplace. you got to have a good and healthy and safe living environment for any children being watched, too. And there are problems in that, too, for sure. All right. Good discussion, everyone. Thank you so much for coming today. Enjoy the rest of your Sabbath day of rest. And uh, two weeks from today, we will continue our series uh, looking at preferential option for the poor and vulnerable. Um, so this fir these first few weeks look more at our place in society, as ro our role as people and families. The next three will look at how we uh, serve the poor, integrate everybody into one human family, and then you know, promote care for the earth in which we all live. So those will be coming up in the month of February after mom's group meets next week. The following week, we'll be back here for option for the poor and vulnerable. Okay. All right. Thank you very much.